following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Uttar Demerang, Prologue The three Norns, daughters of Erda, gather beside Brunhilde's rock, weaving the rope of destiny. They sing of the past and the present, and of the future, when Wotan will set fire to Valhalla, to signal the end of the gods. Without warning, their rope breaks. Lamenting the loss of their wisdom, the Norns disappear. As day breaks, Siegfried and Brunhilde emerge from their cave. Brunhilde sends Siegfried off to new adventures, urging him to keep their love in mind. As a pledge of fidelity, Siegfried gives her the ring which he took from Fafner's hoard. Bearing Brunhilde's shield and mounting her horse grain, Siegfried rides away. Gother Damerung The Twilights the Twilight of the Gods <coughs> We are now arriving at the end of this great masterpiece that hides profound mysteries that only those that walk on the path of the self-realization of the being can understand. Nietzsche, Nietzsche talked about the Superman but he was mistaken thinking that the man existed. He didn't know that first the man has to be created in order for the superman to act in that man. And this is precisely what here in this great uh, opera is hidden. That superior aspect that only those that walk on the path and are already in the level of human being can understand. Remember that it is written that the man is only a bridge between the intellectual animal and the superman. But we don't have to fall into the mistake of believing that the human being already exists because it doesn't exist. The human being has the possibilities of existing within each one of us. And when we reach that level, then we can understand or walk on the path of the superman. 
Nordic mythology <coughs> explains uh, in a poetic way, speaks to the consciousness, speaks to intuition that we had to develop in order to dig into this marvelous myth that has his roots in the sun, in the solar absolute, in the ains of ore, vehicle of the cosmic Christ. Indeed, the Nordic uh, myth encloses a lot of solar truths that we need to study profoundly in order to understand our being. In this prologue, the three Norns, daughters of Erda, starts woven and unwoven in the loom of the earth, in the loom of their mother, Erda, which bring us into memory that that we call in Latin the anima mundi or the soul of the world which is intimately related with the divine mother nature with the cosmic mother remember that the divine mother nature divine mother kundalini is related with the Arcanum 24th, which is the weaver. This weaver, Divine Mother Erda, is the mother of the three Norns, which represent past, present, and future. Destiny. Or as we can call also in Sanskrit, Karma. Remember the karma of the worlds. Remember that mistake committed by the gods, by the solar gods in the past. When they implanted in the human organism the Kunda buffer organ. With cosmic prop, uh, purposes, of course, because the Kundabafer organ is uh, an element that every humanity receives in a certain period in order for a harvesting of gods to emerge from it. But the gods have to make a special calculation in order to leave that organ in the human organism the proper time, not too much, not too less, in order for the soul of those monads that start their evolution to know about good and evil, as the Bible speaks, to know about desire and suffering, in order to value the sexual energy, in order to value the power of God, which is, of course, the energy of the Holy Spirit, which has two polarities, masculine and feminine which is always and beautifully shown in these operas, in different aspects, with the masculine and feminine, brother, sister, father, mother, and how this marvelous sexual force represented, of course, in the 
rock of Brunhilda. Remember that the philosophical stone of Yesod is that stone with the builders rejected. But that is necessary in the transformation, the revolution that is happening in this opera obviously begins in the rock when Brunhilda, Brunhilda is uh, sleeping, surrounded by the fire of Lucifer, which is a sexual potency, which in this opera receives the name of Loge, which is the same Lucky in the myth. Because really Lucky, the fire, is what transform nature. That's why on the top of uh, the crucified it is written um, mantra or word Ingri. She's a Latin mantra which means Ignis Natura Renovatur Integra. The fire renews nature constantly. Loge, of course, is that fire that acts accordingly with karma. And this is something that we have to comprehend in order to understand Lucifer. Because Lucifer acts according with the laws of the absolute which originates always in a universe. That's why these three norms, which represent karma, past, present, and future, which is the aspect of the Divine Mother woven and unwoven the destiny of this planet of humanity, weaven, weaven and unweaven the destiny or the karma of humanity and start, of course, singing about the past, the present, and the future. <coughs> and when we talk about the past, we go, of course, into this uh, Nordic myth. And we find that in the very beginning, the fire and the light Darkness and cold were precisely in, in each side of the abyss. The abyss was in the middle of these two forces, which eventually united. And from their union, which is obviously an alchemical representation of water and fire, above and below, light and darkness which we can attribute that or to place that into that chaos called that related with the creation of the world. The outcome of that union or that mixture was Ymir. Ymir the giant. That's the first thing that the Nordic myth states. This Ymir the giant is a representation of the monad, the innermost of each one of us. Of course, this innermost, the spirit, the giant emir, the monad, within which all the possibilities of creation exist. This emir the giant represent in this uh, cosmic day the first root race, the polar race, or the protoplasmic race that existed in the beginning of creation. Here, of course, it is written that 
was feeding himself from the udder of the cow that emerged also from this mixture of forces. This car was licking ice from the cold and darkness of the chaos and from her, uh, of her other milk was feeding or was coming out in order to feed Emir, the giant. The Divine Mother here, of course, the car, you know that in India, the symbol of the Divine Mother is the the cow. These four uh, rivers of milk that emerge from the udder of uh, the cow represent the four rivers of Eden, which are written in the uh, Hebraic myth that emerge from Eden, or from that, the super Eden, the upper Eden. Representation of the two polarities Masculine and feminine, above and below. Because that uh, Emir giant was a hermaphrodite. It is written that from uh, his armpit emerged the first humanity, the first couple, male, female, a hermaphrodite, in other words. And uh, from uh, his feet emerged a monster of six heads, symbol of alchemy. But behold here, to understand this myth, the Nordic myth, that after a while, other, uh, the gods emerge. Bori, which is the father of Bor, and Bor, the father of Odin, Vili and Be, according to this myth. Of course, these are the transformations of that uh, giant which descends in different dimensions in order to appear in the world of creation. Because in the world of creation, we always find the three primary forces that create. And that are hidden always within the giant. Many times we say that uh, within the monad, within that uh, primordial atom, the ends of, there is always hidden the three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which in the Nordic myth is called Odin, Vili, and Ve, which are the three primary forces that destroyed the giant. The myth is that killed the giant in order to create the universe. It's a beautiful symbol, of course. Because from the Ein Sof, which is that giant that everyone has within, emerges creation. Obviously, the three primary forces take from the Ein Sof, from that giant Emir, all the elements that are needed in order for creation to appear. Remember that it is written that everything emerges from the Ein Sof and everything returns into the Ein Sof. So the three primary forces, Keter, Chokhmah, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Odin, Vili, and Ve, take all the elements that they need in order to create the Yggdrasil, and all those uh, uh, parts of the tree of life from the end stuff, from the giant. And this is how the giant dies in order for nature to emerge. But of course, the intelligence of the God is needed in order for that uh, creation to be organized. And the norms speak of the past, how it influenced the present, and how it is going to influence the future. That is what is called the karma of the world. 
In the beginning of this cosmic day, it is written that this great inhabitant of the Absolute, Aparamarta Satya, whose name we repeat always is the Master Aberamento, which in this planet Earth, in this root race, is called Jesus of Nazareth. He was already out of creation. He was immersed within the absolute light. But when he saw all of those forces of emir, immersion, or those monads coming from the absolute in order to creation to appear, he saw the karma of the previous cosmic days that were a very heavy weight in the anima mundi of this planet. And this is how this myth explains from the beginning how the gods intervene in order to plan to help the karma of this world, planet Earth. And uh, of course, this great being, an inhabitant of the absolute, a Paramarta Satya, Jesus of Nazareth, Master of Veramento, left, abandoned the absolute and appeared in the universe in order to help gods and humans. That was, of course, at that time in the chaos. And uh, with time, this great being sent his Buddha, or Bodhisattva, to reincarnate. Because any being, whether a Paramartha Satya, uh, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, or Nirmanakaya, needs always a vehicle in order to express his wisdom, in order to teach the way to save to help. And that's why Jesus of Nazareth, his human soul, was sent to the planet Earth to prepare himself for the great mission that he performed 2,000 years ago. And you know that his being entered into him in order to unite the solar and lunar forces And that's precisely the descension into the universe of the solar gods. Many solar gods came to the earth in order to manage the karma, in order to help this humanity. But as you know, many of them committed mistakes because they didn't take into account the karma of the world. And this is how this opera explains in the prologue how the karma of the world develop. But the gods are always helping. They left the Kundabafer organ too much time in the human organism because they didn't take into account the karma of the previous three rounds. And the problem is, of course, as you see in the opera, how is described the Gother Dameron, the damnation of the gods. The rope, of course, breaks because with the karma that the planet has, they cannot uh, predict the outcome. Because each one of us, instead of uh, annihilating the karma, we increase more the karma. And the lunar forces take strength, force. And the only one that can help in this negotiation with the karma, because nobody mocks the karma, the superior karma, then you see how 
After this uh, singing of the norms about the past, the present, and the future, Siegfried and Brunhilda appears in the stone, in the rock. They are already united. This in the initiate that enters and that wants to be free from this karma, from this heavy log that we have in our backs, has to do. And of course, this is, as uh, in the previous lecture, the speaker explains very well how the two souls have to be united in order to overcome that karma. Because first, the common and current, or I mean the common and ordinary karma has to be overcome, which Siegfried already did it. But now they are going to confront the superior karma, which is related with the falling of Adam and Eve, or the falling of uh, uh, Ask and Embla, according to this myth, and how uh, these two forces were rising in Sigmund and Singlid in initiation, as the opera explains. And of course, if you read the, what the couple sing when Siegfried is going out of that stone and telling uh, uh, Brunhilda, I'm going now to new tasks to confront new problems, but you will be with me. You and me will be one. No matter where we were, we will be one. And this is precisely the, the, the moment in which you explain how the divine soul and the human soul unite and incarnate in the physical world in order to descend again into the ninth sphere and to perform what we explained before the Enneagram which is all of the work of the second mountain. In the opera, you see only certain points of the second mountain, not the whole thing. When uh, uh, Siegfried lives, he goes and rides in Brunhilde's horse, which is, of course, her wisdom, her understanding. Now he are one and have all the protection of the divine soul in him. Many great uh, work, works or jobs, tasks are in front of him. And of course he leaves the ring of power in the hands of Brunhilda. Because the knight always gives his works, all the outcome of his marvelous esoteric work to his divine soul. In other words, the monad absorbs always all of that. Remember that we always say initiations, degrees, powers are always absorbed by the monad. And the monad is represented by Odin and Brunhilde. Because Brunhilda is the divine soul within which the flame of prana or prajna is always burning. Which is precisely his own being. But part of her is the one that is sacrificing, as we explained in the lectures before, in order to descend. This is what Krishna called the reincarnation of the gods. This is precisely the way in which a true master descends. And this is something that we have to comprehend because many Gnostics do not understand the different aspects of the monad or the mastery. When somebody reaches the first mountain, this one incarnates, or whether said, when reaches the fifth initiation of major mysteries, this one incarnates 
the human soul. This human soul is just Siegfried. That's the symbol of it. Incarnated there as a bodhisattva. In the direct path. Not the spiral. The direct path. But it's still, that initiate has not incarnated his innermost. Many Gnostics think that when somebody reaches the fifth initiation and takes the direct path, automatically incarnate the innermost. They are wrong. And this is how they are being caught in lies and mythomania. Because they think that because they reach the fifth initiation, they are, the innermost is already inside of them. No. The innermost is the prajna, the light that burns within the divine soul. And in order to incarnate, you have to kill the dragon, Fadner. In other words, all the ego related with the earth, all that negativity. Then the innermost incarnates because it's within uh, Brunhilde. And this is the, precisely the moment in which we see uh, in the, this prologue that is going to start another step ahead. The way of the Superman in which already the monad is going to act in the following that our speaker will say it now. Act 1. The act begins in the hall of the Gibichungs, a people that dwell by the Rhine. Gunther, lord of the Gibichungs, sits enthroned. His half-brother Hagen advises him to find a wife for himself and a husband for their sister, Gutrun. He suggests Brunhilde for Gunther's wife and Siegfried for Gutrun's husband. He has given Gutrun a potion to make Siegfried forget Brunhilde and fall in love with Gutrun. Under its influence, Siegfried will win Brunhilde for Gunther. Siegfried appears at Gibichung Hall, seeking to meet Gunther. Gunther extends his hospitality to the hero, and Gutrun offers him the drugged drink. Unaware of the deception, Siegfried toasts Brunhilde and their love. Drinking the potion, he loses his memory of Brunhilde and falls in love with Gutrun instead. In his drugged state, Siegfried offers to win a wife for Gunther, who tells him about Brunhilde and the magic fire. They swear a blood brotherhood and leave for Brunhilde's rock. Meanwhile, Brunhilde is visited by her Valkyrie sister, Valtraute, who relates how Wotan returned from his wanderings one day with his spear shattered. Wotan ordered branches of Yggdrasil, the world tree, be piled around Valhalla, sent his ravens to spy on the world and bring him news, and currently awaits in Valhalla for the end. Valtraute begs Brunhilde to return the ring to the Rhine Maidens, since the ring's curse is now affecting their father, Wotan. However, Brunhilde refuses to relinquish Siegfried's token of love, and Valtraute ri rides away in despair. Siegfried arrives, disguised as Gunther using the Tarnhelm, and claims Brunhilde as his wife. Though Brunhilde violently resists, Siegfried overpowers her, snatching the ring from her and handing and placing snatching it from her hand and placing it on his own. <coughs> we are here. You see how the first act begins with the Gibich Hans or Gibi Hans. In these uh, words, it is something very significant that you find Gibi Hans is how you say it, which is of course a kingdom. And uh, the king of that is called Gunther. And uh, he reigns there with, her, with his sister, Gutrun. 
Do you see the similarities here or the thing hidden there? Which in this case we will say is Gnosis, the G of the Masons, the G of Genesis. Hmm. If in the second opera, the Valkyria, you find the S, the Sikh, with Siegfried, with Sigmund, with Singlet. Here you find Gratterdammerun, Gibbish, or I mean Gibberun, Gibbish, Huns, Gother, Gunther, Guthrun, G. This is, of course, the rune Gibur. The mystery of the rune Gibur is precisely the swastika. Gibur is represented as a cross. But when that cross is in movement, you find there the mysterious swastika, which is the cross in movement. The rune Gibur hides the great mysteries of the Saha Maituna, the great mysteries of sexuality, which here, in this opera, in this fourth part, is shown very clear for those that walk on the path, for those that study the doctrine, for those that know how destiny is transmitted to a vehicle. Remember that there is between these three G's, Gunther, Guthrum, the gods, even in English you say gods with G, Gnosis, Somebody is there that really doesn't belong. And his name begins with H, is Hagen, which means hook, which represents the inheritance of damnation or the evil will of Alberic. Because this Hagen is a son, a mixture of Aryans with Atlanteans. Remember that Alberic represents the cunning of the Atlantean civilization, the Nibelungans. Because in the Atlantean epoch, they developed this faculty, which is cunning. But in this Aryan race, the faculty which is above cunning is reasoning. In the way in which we developed, if we are objective reasoning, of course, wisdom. But somehow, still, some Aryans, people that work at the shore of the river, do not understand what is wisdom and what is cunning. When you find that Guthrun, Guthrun and Gunther are really kings, queens. They are royal people, meaning initiates. Because in order for you to become a king, or as in Kabbalah we explain, a Malakin, which is in Tifereth, if you said, I am a Malakin, a king or a queen, you are saying, I have my astral, mental and causal bodies. I am dressed with Tosoma Helia Kong, the solar bodies. So this is precisely the development of this uh, uh, first part, because Siegfried is navigating in the river. Because everything that we perform here is in the river. 
in the sexual force, in the waters, and that he is performing great tasks related with the Enneagram of the second mountain, when you have to go and annihilate your ego in other levels. Not in the level that we are doing here. Because he already annihilated the dragon of the earth, which is that uh, karma or those egos related with 96 loss. Now he's going deeper, in navigating in that river and to going to hell in order to annihilate other creatures, which the Master Samael explains very clear in the three mountains. But that damnation of the Kundabafer, that mistake of the gods from the past, is still active in humanity. And very clear, of course, for those that follow the path. Hagen is that double psychology that each one of us has. Because we have within the aspects of the being. And any initiate that walk on the path develop his being, his spiritual soul, his divine soul, his human soul, but has also the ego there, which in this case represents Hagen, how the personality works. Through that uh, double aspect or double per, uh, psychology. In other worlds, in other planets, you find humanity with a very strong spirituality. With Ymir, is very strong and big. Nothing negative. But only in this planet Earth you find that old duality in which the lunar and solar forces are disequilibrated, out of balance. And Hagen, of course, is very strong and always is within any uh, kingdom, within any court. If you study, for instance, this opera from the superficial point of view, you will see how in this humanity, the Aryan race, unfortunately, the ego is fully developed, very strong. And that is precisely our own particular Hagen, which through inheritance, through time, has become strong. And the problem is that there are people that fortify and that worship that Hagen, that false personality that we have within and worship it through even through religion so you find that the damnation of the gods or the mistake of the gods has been inherited through this double psychology that we have Hagen <coughs> through three factors. The first factor is that that we call genotype, which is related with the genes. And of course, that is transmitted to the sexual act. All of us receive that damnation, or as the Bible says, the original sin through the sexual act. Because all of us are children of fornication. No exception. Children of adultery. No exception. Because orgasm, spasm, is fornication. is damnation. It's a sin against the Holy Ghost. A sin against the spear of Watan. And when we walk in this path, we have to face that unforgivable sin. And this is something that people forget. When they enter into the path, they think that because we are on the path, we are going uh, out of sin. No. Even the, 
We will say the exotericism outside when they talk about the forgiveness of sins. They think that fornication and adultery is forgiven when they accept Jesus. Which is really false. Because it is written there in the same Bible that fornication and adultery is an unforgivable sin. Everybody has to pay that with death. I repeat, with death. Only with death you are free from that kamaduro and karma saya. Karma of fornication and adultery. So, of course, genotype, we are the outcome of genotype, inheritance. Our fathers, or our parents in this case, put it in our body, that inheritance, in our blood. In our flesh, in our bones. Because we have the elements that bring into our physical body that damnation. And that is precisely what we call lust, cupidity, anger, greed, and all those defects that we have in abundance. Those elements are the magnet, is the hagen within. Or we will say it, to better explanation, is the alberic within that eventually will build the future sun, which is Hagen. So this Hagen is the outcome of alberic through time. And this is how precisely why Watson says he has already have a child. Alberic has a child, an inheritor, an heir, in other words. So, phenotype, education, the type of education that we receive in this day and age, most of it is related with cunning, cunningness, and how our personality strengthened in a negative way. And we are looking just for money, for gold. Anyone in this world wants to have money. They think that they will find happiness in money, in gold. This society is built on, the, uh, uh, on that uh, uh, greed, covetousness. The phenotype that we receive is false. And even in this time, these personalities... False personalities, these hackings that are, are abundant, they uh, are atheists. And they think that atheism is the summit of wisdom. They are against the gods. They destroy all the religions. And of course, Paratype, circumstances, is the other factor with which Hagen, the personality, the outcome of that alberic that we have within, evil will, which is uh, based on fornication, develops. These are the three factors, genotype, phenotype, paratype, that build this false personality, which is built upon the subconsciousness which is coming from the past. It's time the initiate has to confront. That's why when they fall and they confront that, they, they, they found a, a great uh, problem. Because the enemy is never outside. The enemy is inside. And that's precisely the problem of many initiates. That they focus always that the problem of the salvation is outside. And they always condemning other religions. Or accusing other people. And forget that the real damnation, the, the real traitor is within each one of us. If we do not annihilate the interior traitor, we will be always on the same level. 
When we accuse others of being traitors, this is Hagen accusing other Hagen of being Hagen, which points stupidity, imbecility, rooted precisely in the ego. And it's precisely because Hagen is so strong that we think or he thinks that he will have the power of the ring. Or the power of all the process of initiation will be in his hand. And this is precisely the problem of many Gnostics in this day and age. That always accuse others. Meanwhile they have within them the three traitors. So you see here how this uh, upper couple, Brunhilda and Siegfried, the human soul and the human soul within the initiate, are happily receiving their initiations, their union, their love, because they are united by love. But below, in the physical world, you find another brothers, which are Gunther and Guthrun, but are not the common and ordinary brother and sister that are in sin. They are initiates. They are handling weapons. Could be any group of initiates that know about the rune Gibur, the swastika, the power of the cross in movement that originates universes, that originates monsters, <coughs> beasts, and human beings. Without the rune Gibur, without the swastika, nothing can exist. Remember that through the swastika, through the cross, is how Balder, the beautiful son of Odin, that in this case has a similitude related with Siegfried, which is innocent, beautiful, strong, a warrior, but still is innocent and doesn't realize uh, how this fate is going to finish. But he is doing the work because everything is altered. Everything is transformed above and below with the swastika, within the initiate and within humanity. It depends how we use it. It comes into my mind, of course, this initiate that everybody knew with the name of Hitler, who knew about the mysteries of the swastika, but which in the end was cheated by Hagen, by the Hagen of others and by his own particular Hagen, and start using the swastika in their own way. And instead of the centigrade of arriving at the self-realization, he became a dangerous Hannah's Mus, which is precisely the great problem in this Kali Yuga that happened to many initiates. One needs to know how to use the swastika. The swastika is good when it is guided by the being when they, our inner being commands it and cons controls it. Because when somebody reaches mastery, has to be always under the guidance of the being. Only the being can say, go down to the nice sphere, now stop, don't do it. People think that the whole rules follow for the same initiates, or for all initiates, but they are wrong. Because every initiate in itself has a different karma. And the being knows how to handle that karma. And that's why we cannot say, oh, at a certain time we have to stop 
being in the ninth sphere or using the swastika. Only the initiate that walks on the direct path knows when to use it, when to stop to use it. Because I repeat, everybody has a different type of destiny. There are initiates that fell very deep. Others that didn't fall so deep. So in order to deal with that, with the Rune Gibur, the mysteries of the swastika, we need to study very deep our own particular individual karma. And that's why Gunther and Gudrun, the brothers, bring us into our mind Adam and Eve again, but not falling, standing. Of course, the brother is the brain and the sister is the sexual organs, as we always explain. The sister, Eve, Gudrun, has always the cup. While Gunther has always the brain, which symbolizes knowledge, wisdom. So, of course... Sifrid, within any initiate in the physical world, at that level, is performing great tasks, great marvels. But remember that if uh, Gunther represents the brain and Gutrun the sexual organs, obviously Hagen represents the evil will the way in which we satisfy desires and we can be cheated by our own particular ego represented in the personality. And this is how, after performing great tasks, after, after performing great works, Siegfried finally arrived at the physical world because the court, the kingdom of uh, Gunther is in Midgard. And we explained before that Midgar is Malkut, the physical world, when everybody has his physical body, where we always have the negative aspect of the being, which is the personality. Because we have to understand that if the beam is shining above of the master, here below, the darkness, the karma, superior or inferior karma, is always glowing tenebrously through the personality of the initiate. Because that personality is the one that inherited the past. And uh, within that personality, is the damnation of fornication and adultery of the past that need to be washed in order for that initiate to achieve, to achieve self-realization. So this is what you have to see and to visualize. The Brother and sister above, and the brother and sister below. When the initiate arrives at this uh, moment in the opera, when you see that uh, he drinks the cup of forgetfulness, what is that? But wonders, right? And here's precisely the problem. When the, the initiate has to confront his death and resurrection. And that happens to many initiates at that level. 
Many Gnostics try to explain the, what happened with the Master Samael on the or at the end of his life. Many esotericists try to explain what happened with the Master Jesus at the end of his life. How come uh, they caught him and killed him? If he was almighty, all-powerful. And they ignore that in the cross, on the swastika, in activity, Master Jesus said, My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? All the powers, as in Sigmund, are taken out, as well Siegfried. All his powers are being to, to be taken out with that purpose, in order to be completely free. Then the initiate has to confront, in the physical world, his original sin. Because all of us, without exception, at the time of Adam and Eve, we fell into fornication. We committed adultery. We betray, in other words, Brunhilda or the female, their own particular uh, prince. But in this case, which is represented in the female aspect, Brunhilda, the female aspect, was betrayed. Because each one of us has his own, part, his own divine couple, his twin soul. That twin soul is within, is Brunhilda. But in the moment when we committed fornication, we betrayed Brunhilda, we committed adultery. In fornication. So be, behold here, these two aspects. Fornication and adultery are related with sexuality. And these are the first sins committed by humanity. First, through fornications, enter, enter adultery. And in Kabbalah we explain many times. Kabbalah says that when Adam fell, was married with two women. Lilith and Nahema. Or psycho psychologies, in other words. Nahema is destroyed by Sigmund or by Siegfried, we said, when confront the dragon. But Lilith is confront, of course, in the Enneagram, in the second mountain. But at the end of that, he has to drink the cup of forgetfulness. And that cup is in the hands of Gudrun. Which, of course, we know very well that the cup represents the yoni, the sexual feminine organ. And that's precisely the first step is to marry. He says, by toasting to Brunhilda, he drinks the cup because he's the last task. When his inner being says, well, now you have to confront the woman with which you fell in the past. And you have to marry her. You have to transmute with her because with her you fell and with her you have to lift up completely resurrected. If the angel refuses, he says, well, if you want to rise yourself to the level in which you were united with me, you have to confront that. You betrayed me with her in the past. Now you have to face the consequences. Go with her and transmute with her. But be careful because she will try to make you fall again at this level in which you are. And the initial does it. Because if he doesn't do it, he won't resurrect. Because the karma of Karma Zaya and Karma Duro is rooted there in that treason that he committed in the past. And he has to face that. But if he doesn't do it, of course, he will be invulnerable. Invulnerable. Protected by the forces of the spirit. But if he does it, he will lose that protection. And that's necessary in order for the karma that is a damnation, that is a curse 
rooted in Hagen from the past because of the treason committed by Alberic had to be fulfilled. And that is the nation of the ring. Everybody has that nation of the ring inside in, in his own psychology. But you pay that only at the end. Remember how the great initiates at the end die. And they pass for a great humiliation. And of course, when the initiate enters and confronts his new partner in the physical world, it sounds like adultery, right? And it's adultery. And everybody will see it. And it will be a scandal. But that's precisely the, the way. This is unforgivable karma and you have to face it. And in the moment when he starts practicing sexual magic with his new wife, from that cup, he receives all the damnation, all the ego. Remember that is written, you shall not commit adultery. Because when you commit adultery, you absorb the psychological elements from the partner that you are committing adultery. Then you have to fight not only with your elements, but with the elements of your partner. You poison yourself, in other words. And this is something very delicate that nobody understands. That's why you shall not commit adultery. But an initiate at that level in which Siegfried is, he has no ego. He's completely innocent. He is courageous, powerful, has no fear. But he absorbs the ego of the woman with, with he fell in the past. And that's precisely the elements that make him to forget about his own spirituality. Because those egos absorb. And that's why you f find here how Brunhilde feels betrayed. Because it's a great pain for the, human, uh, for the divine soul. The initiate is already united. It's, it's, the two souls are there. They are together. And through that physical action, going into another woman, because it is written that sexual act at that level is prohibited. But then you said, now you can go down and do it. So when they do it, of course, Brunhilda immediately notices it. But... When he drinks the cup, all of that goes to the brain. Because Guten, Gunther, in other words, the brother, has to marry her, which is the brain. You see, if Guten is the sexual organs, Gunther is the brain. The two polarities, forces there, remember that when Eve eats of the fruit, infects Adam. With his action. Or with her action, I mean. So, Gunther, Gunther goes up. Or Siegfried goes up, disguised as Gunther. Obviously, Siegfried is already having the ego of Gunther, or that aspect of psychology within him. Gunther and him are one. Because they even drank the blood. Remember that the blood is the vehicle of the spirit. And how everything unites. After he drinks the forgetfulness cup, he drinks the blood. And obviously becomes a brother. It's something united there. The whole ego of the partner is inside. And goes up. Because Siegfried already is in that level. And goes up to the same level in which Brunhilda is. And Brunhilda says, what is this? My human soul came here courageously, victoriously. And now this part, what is this? And he, or she I mean, visualizes something filthy. Of course it's the ego. Or that new partner. In which now is confront. In which divine and human soul had to confront precisely the original sin. Which is related 
with male female, which is related with Idap in Gala, which is related with Adam and Eve. There are two polarities, up, above and below. And that's why he entered disguised with that Hamlet, which is the mind. In other words, that new aspect that Brunhilda doesn't recognize and that Siegfried is disguised with it. Siegfried is disguised now with a new uh, aspect of the ego. So Siegfried now has to fight and to defeat those psychological aspects that he took from his new partner in the sexual act. And this is precisely, I repeat, what happened. Only to those initiates that are already without ego. Because if you with ego will do that, and then will you make a mess of you. Because you have still your ego of the 96 lusts and the egos of others, and of course you bring more ego into you, you will be more in darkness. But in this opera, it's very clear. Siegfried already killed the dragon, Siegfried already performed many attacks of the Enneagram, and finally, without ego, innocent, clear, and pure, appears there and is merry, in order to confront the last task, which is to overcome fornication and Kamaduro, and takes his wife, and he starts losing his powers, and Hagen, which is precisely rooted in the original sin, is going to plan his killing. Because with death, you overcome death. Of course, meanwhile, Brunjilda received notifications in the upper worlds, the spiritual soul, that is a revolution in heaven. That already Odin, his own father, knows what is going on and everything is going to be changed. Because where the actions of Siegfried and because he overcome, he overcame the spear of Wotan, everything will be changed. Now new laws have to appear. Because the final step into the self-realization is coming. And the old laws no longer are in use. Because a new objective reasoning of the being is being developed through the fire, through logic, and all his tricks. So, let us now continue with the second act. Act 2. Hagen, waiting by the bank of the Rhine, is visited in his sleep by his father, Albrecht. On Albrecht's urging, he swears to acquire the ring. Siegfried arrives as dawn breaks, having secretly resumed his natural form and traded places with Gunther. Hagen summons the Gibichung to welcome Gunther and his bride. Gunther leads in a downcast Brunhilde, who is astonished to see Siegfried. Noticing the ring on Siegfried's hand, she realizes she has been betrayed. She denounces Siegfried in front of Gunther's vassals. Siegfried swears on Hagen's spear that her accusations are false. He, leads, he then leads Gutrun and the bystanders off to the wedding feast leaving Brunhilde, Hagen, and Gunther alone by the shore. Deeply shamed by Brunhilde's outburst, Gunther agrees to Hagen's suggestion that Siegfried must be slain for his honor to be regained. Brunhilde, seeking revenge for Siegfried's treachery, joins the plot and tells Hagen about the hero's sole weakness. Though she had used her magic to ward him from harm, she had left his back unguarded, knowing that he would never flee from a foe. Hagen and Gunther decide to lure Siegfried on a hunting trip and murder him. <coughs> so, 
<coughs> so, by following this, you see how Katansia, Karmasaya, and Kamaduro is being fulfilled. With this, we have to state no one mocked the law. No one escapes karma. There are many types of karma which are for, forgiven. But fornication and adultery are unforgivable. Especially if it's a fallen bodhisattva, which is related with katansia. Here you see, of course, that Alberic appears in a dream to Hagen in the beginning of this part. The dream, subconsciousness, infra consciousness. You all know what dreams means and that comes from. And of course, in all the subconsciousness, infra consciousness, we find the dream world our own particular alberic, which is not one but legion, synthesized in evil will. Because when we betray our God in the past through fornication, we did it through evil will. Alberic stole the Rheingold that the three uh, maidens, the three uh, Mermaids were holding in the waters, which is the waters of sexuality. But here, in all this part, you see how Hagen is no longer a Nibelung, but the mixture, I said, Nibelungen with Aryans, which is this Aryan race. We are no longer Atlanteans, but we are the mixture of the Atlantean civilization with the Hyperboreans. And this is precisely what we have to emphasize always. Because the very root of this Aryan race lies in the uh, uh, Hyperboreans, which were mixed with the Atlanteans in the fourth sub-race in the past. And the Atlanteans are the inheritance of cunning. And we inherit wisdom from the Aryans. Unfortunately, this mixture is everywhere. And the lunar forces of Hagen are strong. Even though uh, everywhere that you see, you find this mixture, because the Aryan race populates all the planet Earth, seven sub-races. We are now here in the United States and Canada, where the seventh and last sub-race of the Aryan race is being developed. But we ha before we had, of course, other previous races. And the Hyperboreans were precisely taking care of these solar gods, were taking care of this Aryan race in different continents, to different ways. Those are what we call the world sons, or the children of Wotan, the children of, of God. Or as we said in Christianity and Judaism, prophets. The prophets are the world sons. The ones that were in contact, warriors, that were performing the work of God in the earth. And of course, there, Wilson's always developed in different ways. But now, uh, in order to overcome the Katansia, Kamaduro, and Karmazaya, Alberic is reminding him, remember the ego, that we had the power in the past. Remember that you are my son. <coughs> are you sleeping? Hagen, remember that 
the followers of the lunar force are awakened. Black magicians, which in this case are represented by Hagen, which enter in every way. It is written that Jave, the boss of the Black Lodge, took into his hands all the religions of the world in order to control humanity. Of course, Jave is the boss of all of those awakened black magicians that are always trying to steal the power in order to conquer, in order to gain the battle. The only thing that they gain is power in Klippoth in hell, but never in heaven. They talk about heaven, talking about paradise, but they never enter because they are traitors. They are awakened. And their own past, their own psyche, always within. I say, Are you sleeping, Hagen? He says, No. I am planning here how to gain the ring that we own by inheritance, by our own right. That reminds me what the Master Samael on the Earth states. He says that when somebody enters and, and, and gains a new initiation, new powers, the black magicians get infuriated. Somebody is stolen from us. Somebody is taking from us powers. Because they think that they own the earth. So obviously they are always planning and complotting against the solar light. So obviously, since Siegfried is already absorbed within the lunar force, because he wants to defeat it, Hagen thinks that is an opportunity in order for him to take the power of the ring because it's in his hand already. It was in the hands of Brunhilda, now it's in his hand. Because it's the power. And he thinks because the apparently adultery that is shown, that he will take part of it. The law uh, allows that to happen. Because with the, during the process of that uh, uh, event of an apparently, or apparent adultery, you know that Siegfried swears that he didn't commit adultery. And it's true. Because Balder, Christ, incarnated within that Siegfried initiate, is innocent. He's just sacrificing. The Lord always sacrifices for the initiate. And when the Lord says, I never commit adultery, he's saying the truth. But remember that when he, Siegfried, went up to the rock, uh, Guthrun, Gunther, I mean, was with him. Gunther and him were one. Meaning that Gunther is the one that is committing that because of the advice of Hagen, his own personality. So when he swears that he didn't commit adultery, he's saying the truth. But meanwhile, he is committing it. You see that, uh, how you said, uh, contradiction? That's why it is written that when the Lord is incarnated, when Balder, Christ, the Son of God, is incarnated in an initiate, he being innocent is accused of being guilty. Because he mingles with the ego of the initiate. And this is what happened with many great initiates. They are being accused by other initiates that are on the path. That's why the whole drama appears there when all the initiates in that castle are listening to Brunhilde say and what Siegfried is saying that they, all of them are innocent, there is no adultery. Meanwhile, it is just adultery. And, and yeah, it is adultery. 
it, there is adultery there of the past. This is something that is being unfolded there, very clear, and the initial has to pay the consequences. But somebody is being killed there, or is going to be killed innocently. And somebody is being accused there innocently. First, Brunhilda is being accused of adultery. And she really committed adultery unwillingly. But because of the circumstances, she is an adulteress. But because of the mistakes of Gutrin, the physical woman. And this is precisely the great sacrifice that is shown there in the opera. How Christ sacrifices himself for the initiate. In order to redeem him. He takes the things as his own. But he is not guilty. He is innocent. But by mixing himself with him, he looks like innocent. I mean like uh, guilty. And that's why in different times, initiates were accused by other initiates, by other people of committing mistakes at that level. And when and they ignored when that when they were doing that, they were accusing the Christ, because Christ was incarnated within them. And they ignore that they were doing that, they were gaining karma. Because all of them are followers of the Lord, Christ. And because they are not at that level, or because they are not following the direct path, they misjudge the initiate. And by accusing the initiate, they are accusing Christ. And they are gaining karma. This is called the Phariseeism. It's still in this time, you see, in the forum, we find people that are always talking about that process with the Master Samael on Beor. In this case, the Master that was in Mexico was the new Siegfried. And he was in that process at that moment. And everybody, because they were only uh, fanaticals of Gnosticism, didn't understand that. And we're accusing the Christ, or accusing in him. Meanwhile, he was redeeming him. This is precisely the paradox and the sadness of our psyche that we don't see clear. And this is precisely what happened at that time with Jesus of Nazareth as well. Because he was falling, he was rising, he was going to resurrect. And this is how Yahweh and his followers took advantage that his inner being was withdrawing in order for him to, to, to effect the resurrection. And in that moment, they kill him. They torture him. So, of course, honor is being spoke about in this uh, part. Honor. Remember that honor is related with the level of Siegfried, with the second triangle. Gebura, Gedula, Tifereth. That is the area of honor. New rules, new elements, new laws that the common and ordinary human being ignore. Let us now enter into the third, which is the death of our hero and heroine. Act 3. In the woods by the bank of the Rhine, the Rhine maidens mourn the lost Rhinegold. Siegfried happens by, separated from the hunting party. They urge him to return the ring and avoid its curse, but he ignores their tidings of doom. They swim away, predicting that Siegfried will die and that his heir, a lady, will treat them more fairly. Siegfried rejoins the hunters, who include Gunther and Hagen. While resting, he tells them about the adventures of his youth. 
Hagen gives him a drink that restores his memory, and he tells of discovering the sleeping Brunhilde and awakening her with a kiss. Suddenly, two ravens fly out of a bush, and as Siegfried watches them, Hagen stabs him in the back with his spear. The others look on in horror, and Hagen calmly walks away into the woods. Siegfried dies, lingering on his memories of Brunhilde. His body is carried away in a solemn funeral procession. Back in Givichung Hall, Gudrun awaits Siegfried's return. Hagen arrives ahead of the funeral party. Gudrun is devastated when Siegfried's corpse is brought in. Gunther blames Siegfried's death on Hagen, who defiantly admits to the murder and claims the ring on Siegfried's finger by right of conquest. When Gunther objects, Hagen attacks and kills him. However, as Hagen moves to take the ring, the dead hero's hand raises threateningly, and he recoils. Brunhilde makes her entrance and takes charge of the scene. She issues orders for a huge funeral pyre to be assembled by the river and sends Wotan's lurking ravens home with anxiously longed-for tidings. She takes the ring and tells the Rhine maidens to claim it from her ashes once fire has cleansed it of its curse. The pyre lit, Brunhilde mounts her horse grain and rides into the flames. The fire flares up as the Rhine overflows its banks, bearing the Rhine maidens on its waves. Hagen leaps after the ring and drowns. The Rhine maidens swim away, bearing the ring in triumph. As the flames increase in intensity, Valhalla comes into view in the sky. Bright flames seem to flare up in the hall of the gods, in which the gods can be seen finally hiding them from sight completely. The curtain falls. So, <clears throat> of course, the death of Siegfried is coming from the hands of Brunhilda. Brunhilda advises Hagen to do or how to kill Siegfried because she knows that with the death of Siegfried, Hagen will die because he is the same damnation. Brunhilda plays a dumb, not knowing what is going on. But in the depth, the gods know that the damnation of the ring, the end of that curse of fornication and adultery, the Kundavafer damnation will finish with the death of the inheritance, which is within the body of Siegfried, because he absorbed it. As you see there, it says that he absorbed the damnation. And even the three maids or maidens of the Rhine are advising him to deliver the ring. And this is how many initiates are tempted by the gods above and below to abandon the path. That's why Jesus of Nazareth said in the Mount of the Olives, Father, if it's possible, if it's possible, take this cup of bitterness out of me. Because he sees what is coming. But not my will, but thine be done. And that's precisely what happened. He knows. As his death is coming, he takes the cup. If he obeys his guide and says, Go into the night sphere and take that woman. Because with her you fell. Redeem her as well. Because not only you had to be redeemed, but her as well. I will redeem her, you and her, through that action. And for that, of course, a great revolution, new change, new laws, new objective reasoning will emerge. All the gods that ignore that uh, and seeing what is going to happen 
warned Siegfried through the three maidens, which are the three, three norms as well, in different aspects. Don't do it. Give, you, give the ring to us, the power to us. In other words, don't follow that sequence. But uh, Siegfried has no fear to death. He knows that he's going to die. He knows that this is the only way to be rid of the damnation. And that's why his own wisdom, his own spirit, Brunhilde, is telling Hagen how to do it. In order to die. That's why he says, with his death, he will kill death. And a whole transformation will occur. And of course, when the Siegfried is singing, when he is with his work, that's why, as you see there, that when he's singing, it says that Hagen gave him another cup to remember. There's a process of alchemy in which the initiate is going deeper and deeper in even reaching the very origin of sin. And he remembers very clear how everything happened. His consciousness is completely awakened and knowing more about good and evil. Remember that is written the day that you eat from that fruit, your eyes will be open. And you will be like gods, as gods, knowing good and evil. But this good and evil has many levels. <coughs> and in many lectures we said that it has six degrees of objective reasoning. So every time that a phoenix bird rises from his own ashes, his wisdom is higher. His objective reasoning is in another degree. And it's only, of course, through the eating of the tree of good and evil is how you go and know about good and evil. Sexuality. And that's why you find there are temptations, ordeals that you have to pass in order to finally achieve that level in which you will realize more about God and his mysteries. This is related with Jonah as well. And of course, Siegfried is singing about the past. His intuition, the bird of spirituality, that power of the past, of clairvoyance, clairaudience, and all those powers related with those levels of initiative, remember him. Reminding him many things. And with his remembering, he acknowledged that he is guilty of ignorance. And of course, when the initiate finally admits his guilt and his crime, and that he is the very source of it, then the fulfillment comes. Because in order to acquire another level of reasoning, objective reasoning, another level of wisdom, you have to recognize, comprehend. Not just to say, oh, I'm guilty. No. You have to understand, to comprehend the depthness, deepness, the depth. You have to understand the depth of your guilt, your crime. And when you realize that, you really have to accept that you are guilty. And if you don't accept that, you are not in that level yet. To accept that is to recognize your own nothingness. Is to kneel be behind God as Job does it in the Bible and say, naked I came from the womb of my mother and naked I will return. I am nothing. God is everything. We recognize that when he sings that. And then of course, 
he, he gives his back to the law to be fulfilled that always act through Hagen. And he stabbed him in the back. Treason. Because treason is paid with treason. He betrayed in the past his own God, now he is betrayed. But with that he is overcoming treason. And eventually, through that process, which is a process that endures one year. When you hear this about the ordeal of Job, you think, oh, yeah, it's a moment like in the opera. No. In the opera happens, of course, in a short time, because nobody's going to be in an opera one year in order to understand, oh, it's one year. You know what I mean? The ordeal of Job endures exactly eight years in the process that we are talking here. But in the last year is when the initiate receives a uh, sickness related with fornication or with adultery, a filthy sickness. That's the way to pay and dies. Or dies in, in any way. But that's the process in which your body is decaying and you being you all mighty, all powerful, you get sick and you die. This precisely coming into my mind, the Master Samaelon Veor. With his powers, he cured a lot of people. But at, that, at the last time of that year, when he was passing that ordeal of Job, in 1976, 1977, yeah, the last year, he couldn't heal himself. He was passing the last year, and he was feeling pains in this area of the abdomen. The liver and all the areas related with the kidneys, related with sex. Receiving his own Katanzia, his own Kamaduro, his own Kamazaya. Nobody understood that. But only we that study completely all the drama, we understand. And he is not the first one, neither the last one. But now he is free. And with his death, he killed Hagen and all the traitors. Because at the end, you see how Brunhilde comes and unites with him and receives the same punishment. We told you in the beginning that Brunhilde was that part within which the powers of Balder, the powers of Christ are hidden. And how she sacrifices for the warrior. And she takes also those that sin and rides on his on her horse together in order to die in the flames with his with her hero. And that's precisely the great end. Ingri the fire logge of nature Transform completely everything. Ingri, ignis natura renovator integra. And all that fire goes up to Valhalla, to the superior aspect of the being. And even everything is destroyed and renewed with the resurrection. Because remember that, according to mythology, when Valhalla ends. Balder resurrects and becomes a new boss of heaven, of the kingdom. In this case, as Balder is within, that Christ, that force, the Redeemer, is within Brunhilde, is within Siegfried, is performing the great work and finally burning in order to kill the damnation of the Kunda buffer organ and returning the power of the ring to the maidens, which in this case represent the waters of the absolute. Because in the end, the absolute absorbs the objective reasoning, the wisdom, the knowledge acquired. But every single initiate, that's why it's written that in the end, the absolute is always more knowable about itself. 
It was written. The Absolute does not know itself. But every cosmic day, the Absolute knows more about itself through all the initiates, through all the heroes that perform this great work that Siegfried performs and that is shown in this uh, opera. So you see that this marvelous sacrifice which was precisely performed 2,000 years ago by Jesus of Nazareth. Since he was, of course, a Paramartha Satya, a new evolution, a new force was uh, surrounded the earth. Since that epoch, the, the, his own being, which is a Paramartha Satya, took the earth as his own body. And from that epoch, the Aureola Borealis, shown, you know. We told you that Aurora Borealis or that light that appears in the North Pole that is coming from the North Vicks, from that great initiate, Nordic initiate, Hyperborean because the Boreas is the North. So the Aurora Borealis means the light of that North is shown with more splendors because that light is helping initiates that enter into the, the, rain, uh, the rainbow, the rainbow, that take uh, the path which takes us from Mid, uh, Midgard to Asgard, to the earth, to heaven. But they had to use the Gibur, the swastika. This is a great symbol. And uh, this, is, this is precisely Gother Dameron, the end of the gods. We will say the end of that level in that particular initiative. Because in this Aryan race, of course, it's also happening <coughs> with humanity. The solar gods were worshipped in the past, but the worship the worship of, uh, or the worshiping of the solar gods in the past is dead now. Atheism is reigning everywhere and they mock the gods. But now, the great wolf, Fernis, which represents karma, is opening his mouth and is going to swallow the earth. The great serpent of Midgard, which represents the ocean, is going to swallow the earth as well. The apocalypse, the end of the world, or the end of the Aryan world, is approaching, is happening. And it's written by the solar gods in the Aztec pantheon. They said that the future sixth root race, the Karate, the gods will resurrect. Because now they are dead. But with the work that we study here and we perform, the God will resurrect. The God will emerge again in the future. Koradi, sixth root race. Because this fifth Aryan race, root Aryan race, is completely degenerated. But still the gods are doing efforts in order to help us. And of course, through this great... Uh, Opera of Wagner, the Ring of the Nibelungen, we receive a lot of help because that music goes within the psyche and teaches all of this. It's more to say, but we need to hear questions in order to continue. Yeah, the ring being acquired again by the Rhine uh, uh, maidens. As we said, the ring is a power. Remember that the goal, the Rhine goal, as we explained in the first lecture, is in the very tip of the phallus, or the forces, the creative forces in the waters. But that goal represents the solar absolute, the ends of ore, 
the power of Christ. That's why when the sun shines, that gold glows, which is precisely that power of the ends of, which is the power of creation. The ends of or is called the ray of Okidanok, is Christ, or Lucifer as well, light and fire that creates, that through the three primary forces creates from the bones and body of Ymir the universe. The Mona itself. But when somebody self-realize and that ring returns into the waters, as I said, is another level of objective reason it acquire. And of course, the absolute, the ends of or, the ends of, absorbs that. And this individual, particular individual, knows himself more. That's why when any humanity reaches that level, every single member of humanity reaches that level of Siegfried, then from the chaos appears a star, a sun, within which all the mineral, plant, animal, and human kingdom are perfect. Of course, our planet Earth is Far beyond that, still there's a lot of monads that are failures here. If by the grace of the law you marry the one you fell with in the past and transmute together, what would be the difference in the process of redemption? What would be the difference in the process of redemption? Oh, well, that's precisely the point. You see here, if you already are, because there are many initiates that are with the spouse, with with they fell in the past. So, therefore, they will continue there and the process will be different. They will be accused of adultery in other ways and fornication in other ways. But uh, let me tell you, it's very difficult to find because after the fall of, uh, of the fall of many initiates, they continue uh, fornicating with many. Who is here in this physical world a soul that never had more than one partner? One fornication was enough with one or with another person in order to be adulterer or adulteress. Of course, if there are one there, that will be very rare that never committed adultery or they fell with this woman and they continue being born with the same woman in different lives and fornicating and having children and finally they find a path, of course, that will be different. That will be another opera. Sub-opera, yeah? You mentioned that the master of Aramento reincarnated into the universe in this cosmic day. Yet, in the Gnostic Jesus section of the website, it is mentioned that his human soul was fallen. Can you explain how he reincarnated if he was fallen? Well, uh, it's a way of saying, when, when somebody reaches and created the solar bodies, he reincarnates. We will say that he's a bodhisattva that reincarnated, or fallen bodhisattva that reincarnated. Because anybody, I repeat, that has solar bodies of reincarnation. But it's a lower level of reincarnation. When we talk about the incarnation of the innermost in Brunhilda, the divine soul, that's only through initiation. That's only when you rise again. When you enter into the path. But when you fall and you are being, having, uh, or you are having different bodies, yeah, you are reincarnating. It's a fallen bodhisattva or a fallen human soul reincarnating learning or receiving it, right. And so Jesus, of course, as the Master Samael explains in major mysteries, was fallen. But, of course, uh, he rose again. You could say the difference is with the fallen body thought that the monad is placing that human soul to suffer. Intentionally. Yeah, yeah. It's a little different from a regular enlightenment. Yeah, Exactly. The case of the Master Samael on the Or, for instance, he was a fallen Bodhisattva, and he said that he had many reincarnations. 
He said, for instance, that he was Julius Caesar in one of his reincarnations. And had many reincarnations in different parts. <coughs> Why? Because he was punished by his being. He tried to rise many times in different lives. But his being internally was punishing him and was not helping him. So he was sending him in another reincarnation and he was trying to rise again. And he was reaching a certain level. But then his being was abandoned. He said, no, this son of mine is a stubborn one. It's not the first time that he fell. It's the third time. So he has to learn. Because if I raise him now, he will do it the fourth, the fifth. No, let him suffer more. This is precisely, he says, blessed be he who, that is punished by God. Because he is teaching him. And Master Samael said in Mexico, believe me, I suffer a lot, he says. In this last fall that I had. And I don't want to do it the fourth time. He said. Because it's so much pain. Hmm? When Siegfried and Hagen die. You mentioned this symbolized the resurrection. How is the third mountain. The mountain of ascension. Symbolized. Well. The mountain of ascension. Is only for resurrected masters. That's something that is beyond. The second mountain is happening in this three-dimensional world. But the third mountain is happening in, the, in Eden. This is another thing. This is another thing that you have to understand. Because also there, you have to enter into other sephira, Into other sephiroth. In order to return completely into the absolute. And then is when the, uh, Siegfried and Brunhilde work in heaven as gods and goddess, God and goddess, and perform other works that are beyond, because they are in another level of being already. So it's not in this opera. It's not in this opera. It's dead. Yeah? What is the meaning of Hagen being the half brother of Gunther and Gudrun? As I said, uh, the half-brother of, of them, because this is precisely what you have. Uh, uh, our own particular ego or personality is a brother of uh, the positive aspects of the being. The personality, Hagen, is a negative aspect of the innermost, which unfortunately carries the karma, katanzia, and in, is the inheritance. You know, of the lunar past. And that way is half. Not completely brother, but half. Because uh, one part is related, of course, with the solar force, which eventually uh, the initial has to disintegrate, because when Hagen is disintegrated, the being absorbs the part of the consciousness, part of the being that we're battle up within it. And of course, the lunar part, which are related, as you know, with uh, lunar bodies and with lunar forces, return into the earth. Because our uh, matters that are mechanical, forces that are related with cause and effect. And we have all of that inheritance. We have the inheritance of cause and effect, karma of the worlds, our past karma, and the inheritance of our father. You see the two? Unfortunately, right now, in the level of which we are, the karma of the world, the inheritance of the damnation, is bigger than the inheritance of our inner being. Another question? When you said that the initiate redeems the one he fell with when he practices with her, does that mean that she loses her ego too? Yeah, of course, that initiate, because uh, she, she is receiving a lot of help. At the end, she dies as well. Or the brother, the two brother and sister die and pass to a great transformation. Uh, the physical spouse is redeemed at a certain level, but not completely. Because the initiative is redeeming himself, but he's saving the one that was fallen 
and she rises again. But of course, she has to uh, to do another process uh, because it's another soul. Her own work. Remember uh, Mary Magdalene, the symbol here. Not talking about physical, symbolically. Jesus took the seven sins from her. He did it through the cup of Mary Magdalene. And that's why she became saint, Mary Magdalene. But before that, she was a prostitute. Because any woman is a prostitute with the ego inside. Any man is a prostitute with the ego inside. But when the Lord comes, redeems that soul, becomes a saint. That's a symbol. Be, be careful here. I remember, I, I repeat again. Symbol, esoteric symbol. I'm not talking about physical here. Right? But symbol of Mary Magdalene and Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. Mary Magdalene is that aspect. And of course, that's why he was accused. Yeah? The difference between cunning versus reasoning. According to the evolution of the brain, the brain, the, the physical brain, has to pass through those processes. Cunning is, is an aspect of the animal, as you see, right? And uh, in the Atlantean epoch, the brain was the, being developed at that level, in which cunning was developing in the uh, we would say not in the reasoning, but in the intellect of those Atlanteans. And uh, an example of that is written, for instance, in Odysseus, when he is overcoming uh, this cyclop, which represents the Lemurian epoch, by cunning. This is the evolution. And of course, now in this Aryan race, cunning is overcome by reasoning. But unfortunately, there are many people that are stagnant in cunning because they don't mix with the Aryans or the Hyperboreans. So they are stagnant there. We have to go ahead in order to develop this uh, reasoning. But of course, the reasoning that uh, uh, mechanically this humanity developed is the subjective reasoning. Even though this subjective reason is, is above cunning, even mechanical. But we are not interested, of course, in subjective reasoning, but objective reasoning, which is above also that uh, cunningness of the serpent that we have to overcome. Different aspects of the development of the being. <coughs> Do you grasp everything? I, I, I hope that you are getting it, everything, because, of course, there is more. If you observe, if you hear the opera, it's beautiful, right? How everything is being fulfilled. And that's why many people do not understand initiation. They fall into the mistake. They think that it's something related with uh, science, in relation with religion, with creed. Of course, it's something in relation with that, but it's more profound. This death, happened to many initiates, not only to Siegfried, but if you read the other mythologies, you find the same process with Osiris, for instance, right? and that they were written in that way for initiates. And those initiates existed. Can many people think, oh, it's a myth? It's because those heroes didn't exist. No, they existed. But based on their life, they created the myth in order to teach and that's why when you read the Gospels, you find the, the myth of Jesus of Nazareth healing his life. But what you read there is not his physical life, but his spiritual development, which is mixed with his physical actions. And if you don't know that, you don't read in between the lines, you follow everything and you think that everything was physical. And then you fall into many mistakes. Every myth has to be studied from the physical point or from the tree of life, in other words. For all the sephirah. And then everything is very clear for us. Because now, only now in this epoch, is how this wisdom is openly ex 
explain before only to initiates. But we are in the end of this iron race, so therefore people need this knowledge in order to understand and if they want to enter into the path of the rainbow to Asgard. More questions? Thank you very much and enjoy the operas one time again and again. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,